welcome to today's episode of Canada mit C, or in English, Canada with a C. My name is Annika Vekinis. I'm the project manager of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung Canada. In today's episode, we will talk about the current state of Canada's national security and its foreign security concerns with one of the most knowledgeable experts on the subject matter. We're particularly pleased to welcome Richard Fadden as our distinguished guest. Richard Fadden was National Security Advisor to the Prime Minister of Canada in 2015-2016. Previously, he was the Deputy Minister of National Defense from 2013 to 2015. He served as the Director of the Canadian Security Intelligence Service from 2009 to 2013. He also served as the Deputy Minister for Citizenship and Immigration Canada, the Deputy Minister of Natural Resources Canada, the President of the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, and Deputy Clerk and Counsel in the Privy Council Office, during which he assumed the additional duties of Security and Intelligence Coordinator. Since his retirement in 2016, he has been on a number of boards and advisory councils, as well as working as a senior fellow at the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Ottawa. Thank you, Mr. Fadden, for being with us today and sharing your expertise. The interview will be conducted by Dr. Norbert Eschborn, Director of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung Canada. Norbert, over to you now. We want to talk about national security today, and I'd like to ask you first, with your decades of professional experience in that field, what do you understand by national security? How has the term evolved over time, and what does it mean today? I think, indeed, the definition has changed over time. In Canada, traditionally, it has been something linked pretty directly to military and terrorist attacks. But now it's somewhat broader, and it's anything, I think, that affects the sovereignty of states or the safety of its citizens, either in Canada or abroad. This can encompass a, vi a vast array of issues, but I think there's also a threshold issue. Uh, international criminal activity is a good example. Modest activity on that basis is not particularly important, but it reaches the point where it affects the capacity of the government to maintain its sovereignty, then I think it becomes a national security issue. I think it's a, it, generally speaking, a fairly broad definition is important, but it cannot affect every single issue where you might think it applies, mostly because uh, it brings to bear particularly strong powers for the government, and you don't want to use these unless it's particularly important at that moment in time. So over the years, the definition in Canada has expanded. I think it's going to continue to expand. It may not become as broad as, say, that of the United States, which encompasses virtually anything that affects the United States. But I think we're heading in that direction. So if we assume that the term national security encompasses more than one dimension, and especially has done so in the last two decades, are you as an expert in the field still able to determine When we are at peace, uh, when we are at war, can we still make a difference between the two states? I think the short answer is no. You cannot easily tell. You know, the International Convention uh, on Armed Conflict, the law of war, requires updating. Um, the definitional problem arises, I think, because that convention is based upon kinetic action, physical action on the part of one state or another. And today you can have all sorts of aggression, ac aggressive activity that have nothing to do with physical attacks and whatnot. So, for example, if Russia's initial use of cyber war in Crimea or Ukraine had stopped there, would the damage that it caused be considered an act of war? I don't think we've resolved that quite, quite yet. So I don't, think it's possible to, uh, to, I don't think it's possible to define it in the old-fashioned way such that we require a military force crossing a country's frontiers. The same issue, I think, arises when a state uses a terrorist group or terrorist activity to advance its objectives. The other, the other issues today is whether or not it's useful or necessary to declare war. You'll know that in the past, countries declared war. Uh, didn't happen after in Afghanistan, although there was a UN basis for that convention. Uh, it did not have to happen after 9-11. And it seems to me that the only real advantage today in declaring war is on the part of the defending country because it enables them to, to bring into play a variety of, of powers and whatnot that they might not have otherwise. In your distinguished career, you have been going through different periods of international security. 
This episode of the podcast is produced on day eight of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Under the impression of that crisis, what do you think will be the consequences for transatlantic relations, A and B, for European security architecture? I don't think we have an absolutely clear answer to that question right now, but let me start with a, a thought that not everyone may be comfortable with. I think Russia's invasion of Ukraine is indefensible, period. But it's not entirely irrational from their perspective. If you look at Russian history and the extent to which they have been invaded, you cannot help but wonder what they think of the West's intention. You'll be aware that during that brief liberal period in Russia when their secret archives were opened, the West was astonished to discover that in fact, during the Cold War, the Russians or the Soviets were expecting an invasion from the West. So I think as we look at all of this, we have to think a little bit about what the other side is trying to do or trying to protect itself. So I don't think European security architecture takes this into account in the sense that while the Ukraine really wants to be part of the West, NATO and the EU, perhaps this is simply not possible at this point in time. Um, I think that NATO should remain the pillar of European security. And I don't think that the EU developing a range of foreign defense and security apparatus is going to necessarily advance the cause. Having said that, uh, nothing would prevent Ukraine, if it does not join an alliance, from developing bilateral security ties with a particular state, with Germany, with Canada, or any other country. Your former position was national security advisor. Can you explain to us a little bit uh, which duties this position encompasses and which particularly which particular challenges uh, do come with it for the incumbent? The Prime Minister in Canada has two institutions which supports him, the Prime Minister's office, less than 500 people, and the Privy Council office, something of the order of 1,200 people. The Prime Minister's office is entirely staffed by partisan political operatives, whereas the Privy Council office is staffed by non-partisan public servants. The National Security Advisor is in that particular category. Um, I think the NSA has three or four main responsibilities. The first is providing information and advice to the Prime Minister on, any on the whole range of national security issues, coordinating national security issues and departments and agencies that operate in that field, and liaising on national security issues with allies and others. Uh, to do this, it requires the National Security Advisor to have a comprehensive knowledge of what's going on in the field, both in Canada and more generally. So I think the NSA is usually presumed to have the right to know on any issue relating to, to, to national security. This is also used to resolve interdepartmental disagreements on national security issues, because in Canada, as in Germany, these arise. It's a position that requires a bit of a delicate touch Because when you're acting as the prime minister and causing departments and agencies to do something that you want them to do, you're coming up against the concept of ministerial responsibility, where they are presumably accountable for what their departments and agencies are doing or not doing. So it's, it requires a bit of doigté, as they say in French. Uh, I think it can be made to work, and it does work. But there's always some sensitivity between the principal ministers on the one hand and the national security advisor on the other. So we have a national security advisor in Canada. We do not have one in Germany. Uh, both countries do not have a national security council. From your perspective, um, are there any reasons which would actually be in favor of establishing such a council in both countries? I think it's useful to start here by defining what is a national security council. And I think in practical terms, it's a committee of cabinet staffed by ministers, sometimes with officials, and usually uh, chaired by the head of government. Uh, they also have a, sec a secretariat supporting them. Whatever it's called, Canada over the years has had a variety of committees dealing with emergencies. Um, we've had one dealing with Afghanistan, we've had one dealing with 9-11. Uh, all of these were sometimes chaired by the prime minister, sometimes not. They are all supported by a secretariat, usually headed by the national security advisor. I do think we get a little bit fixated with the title of national security advisor, when in fact what it is, it's a committee chaired by the PM, 
composed of ministers supported by the NSA. Why doesn't Canada have a formal NSA? I think because we didn't feel it was necessary. We create a special committee when it is necessary. And currently, we have a cabinet committee dealing with safety, security, and emergencies chaired by the emergencies minister and an incident response group, which we're using to deal with the problem, with the problem with the challenge in Ukraine, which is chaired by the prime minister. My sense is if it ever becomes absolutely necessary, we'll create an NSC. But I think what's important is whether or not the government and the prime minister are getting the results they want, not whether a particular institutional framework is used. In your previous position, you relied on intelligence obtained by your country's national intelligence agencies. Now, intelligence professionals claim that 60% of their information are coming from open sources anyway. And there are also memoirs by world-renowned statesmen in which they are highly critical of the value of intelligence agencies and their work. For example, neither the developments which led to German reunification or to 9-11 were predicted by intelligence agencies. Where does their value lie anyway, from your point of view? I think that's a very good question, particularly when we remember that intelligence agencies cost a lot of money and political capital. A director of the CIA once told me that his agency, 90% of the information and intelligence that he used came from open sources. Now, I think it's important to note that open source doesn't mean easy to access. You sometimes find it very, very difficult to find it. But in any event, if you use open sources for advising the government, it has to be analyzed, it has to be synchronized with traditional intelligence, and eventually you have to make a judgment on whether or not the source of intelligence is useful. That's a job for traditional intelligence agencies, I think. I think traditional intelligence agencies today are particularly useful in collecting and assessing intelligence relating to medium to short-term operational issues. Uh, a treaty negotiation, whether or not a particular terrorist organization is planning something of that nature. As to long-term strategic intelligence, and I come back here to 9-11 and the reunification of Germany or the fall of the USSR, I think intelligence agencies can supplement open sources, but they are always there are always underlying trends that anybody can see. I think that's a really big difference from even 20 or 25 years ago, where essentially you had a few think tanks, a few universities and intelligence agencies that did this sort of thing. Nothing prevented open source institutions from cogitating on whether or not the wall was going to fall or whether the USSR was going to cease to exist. So I think there's a real war, war pardon me, there's a real role for intelligence agencies, but it's not the same one as a few years ago. And when it is used, I think they can then take advantage more directly of very intrusive methods of collection that open sources don't have available. If you come to Canada as a foreigner, the impression is that Canadians do not seem overly concerned when it comes to external threats. They think there's an ocean to the west, an ocean to the east, and an ice cap to the north. What can happen to us? Um, is this assessment merely subjective or does it stand up to scrutiny? Three oceans in the United States, uh, plus the fact that for all of our history, we've have fallen under another country's security umbrella, initially the British Empire and now the Americans. I think this accounts for our perception, generally speaking, of threats against us as being much less uh, dangerous than they really are. Having said this, and this is a slightly different angle, When there's a real crisis, the world wars, the Cold War, Afghanistan, 9-11, I think Canada pops the clutch and generally does treat these threats as very, very real. But especially now with threats from the cyber world or space, geography makes no difference at all. And I think there's, a be there's the beginning of a trend in Canada which recognizes that threats from outside of Canada are more relevant than we used to, uh, used to believe Added to this change in environment, there are noticeably growing concerns about the threats posed by China and Russia. Polling, I think, clearly indicates that in Canada. But I think it's important to recognize that the threats are not only traditional ones, but also encompass economic threats that perhaps meet the threshold of the definition of national security that I mentioned a little while ago. Generally speaking, I think your opening question is on point. We don't view threats the same way as many of our uh, 
NATO allies. But I think that is slowly changing, and we're, we're, there's a syn synchronicity that's beginning to, to develop between the Allies and Canada. Canada is a literal state of the Arctic and plays an important role in the Arctic Council. Although the Arctic and the Northwest Passage have become more and more important in the last uh, 20 years or so, and China and Russia play an important role in Canadian spheres of interest there, one has the impression that uh, Canada does not overly value international cooperation in that area. Is that the correct impression? And if so, why is that? I think there's some truth to what you're suggesting. Canada has traditionally been very much against the militarization of the Arctic and also of limiting external activity because of very real concerns about the ecology of the, of the Arctic, uh, perhaps basing ourselves partially on the Antarctic model. I think it's important to recall that the Canadian Arctic has an extraordinarily sensitive ecology and is largely unpopulated, at least by, by European standards. And there again comes some rationale for our concerns about foreign, inv foreign involvement. Having said this, uh, Russia, with respect to not only the Canadian Arctic, but also the European Arctic, its activities and plans, coupled with PRC interests, Canadian views, I think, are changing. And these views are also changing, I think, in part because the population is increasing. There's an increasing growth in interest of economic development and tourism. So putting all this together, I think Canada has slowly accepted that we're going to have to involve others more than we have uh, in uh, the Arctic. And in fact, given Russia's current behavior, I think that NATO's role in the Canadian Arctic will grow to parallel its activities elsewhere in the alliance. How important is it for the work of any national security advisor that the population of his state has internalized what we call the official national threat perception? And uh, what consequences does it have if that is not, is not the case? And what can a public servant do to change awareness here? I really like that question because it was one of the things that I found relatively frustrating when I was NSA. Assuming that the NSA has a realistic view of national security issues, a realistic issue more so than does the population at large, and possibly more realistic than government's public positions are, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a gap there that needs to be reconciled. I mean, I think we first have to recognize that Canadian ministers are briefed on threats. They understand them. But generally speaking, and this is true in any democracy, what they say in public and what they're prepared to approve and resource are two different things entirely. Um, so I think in practical terms, this means that the policies, the, the recommendations on resourcing coming from the NSA are not always easily accepted by the government because of this gap in the perception of the threat uh, that exists between them. So. I actually found this on a few occasions. Uh, my colleagues and I felt that there was a real threat on activity X, and it was very clear that ministers did not believe that this would be acceptable to the Canadian public as a starting point in developing a policy. So what can an NSA do? I think it's very limited because of the strong convention in Canada that uh, public servants do not contradict ministers, and they don't get very far ahead of them in public. Having said that, You know, one can testify before Senate or House committees, the occasional speech, few commentaries on social media. Um, but I think the scope for changing this, this, this gap in, in threats is greater. The chances of improving this is greater. Pressure from the allies or the existence of real crises. Um, the issue is not unique to Canada. Uh, to one degree or, not, or other, I think it's true in, in every democracy, including in Germany. You know, what the government perceives as a threat and what the average man or woman perceives as a threat, not always the same thing. And really, in the end, it's the job of our elected representatives to, to narrow the gap. Looking at the tenure of Canadian national security advisors, the half-life in this position seems to be comparatively short. Why is that? Uh, are you constantly uh, nervous uh, in expectation of bad news, sleeping lousily at night? Or what other reason is responsible for that? Well, I think to one degree you are right. An NSA's job rarely is to deal with uh, good news. And I think most of us who have a position like this tend to compartmentalize. Um, but I think in Canada, for example, my predecessor left early uh, 
before his term was up because he took a job in the private sector. I took the job knowing that I was very near retirement after four years in the public sector, so I retired early. I think another factor in Canada is that we really try hard to give the NSA a mix of foreign defense and security experience. And if you take into account the size of our national security community, there are not a lot of people who can do this. So the judgment has been, I think, by the government, let's appoint somebody with the right mix of experience and accept a shorter term rather than the reverse and appoint somebody for a full term with slightly less experience. I hope we can resolve this because one of the characteristics of the national security sector is that important is the importance of relationships. Uh, it's important in any area of government. It doesn't matter if it's social or economic policy. But I found that in dealing with national security, you often have to be able to look your opposite number in Germany or elsewhere in the eye and develop a professional relationship. And this takes time, no matter what the enthusiasm is. So. I don't think there's a conscious decision on the part of anybody to shorten the, the, uh, the half-life of NSAs, but sometimes for issues related entirely to individuals and sometimes because the right person isn't available, you don't get the kind of term that would be the most desirable. Thank you for having been our guest today at Canada Mitsei. My pleasure. Thank you for joining us today. If you like to stay tuned for upcoming events, publications, and learn more about the work of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung Canada, we invite you to visit our homepage and sign up for our quarterly newsletter at www.kas.de slash Canada. Thank you, and we look forward to welcoming you back to another episode of Canada mit See.